guy is called Andre, right? Andre, I'm not going to give dates and stuff like that. It's not necessary, you know, but so it's just trying to get the story out there a tiny bit from my own observation with it, right? So Andre is this guy from Romania, right? And he's in, he's in Cloverhill Prison, or he was in Cloverhill Prison. He is, or he was in Cloverhill Prison, right? So, and Andre is like a giant, like Andre the Giant, he was massive, but he wasn't all that tall. Like he, like I'm about 5'11", 6 foot. He's about six foot two. So he's only a little bit taller than me. Six foot one, six foot two. He wasn't all that tall, right? But big guy, you know, big arms, big hands, big neck, you know, and didn't really look that Romanian, really. He looked more Polish or he looked more kind of like, you know, from Denmark or something like that, you know, but he's Romanian, right? And he's been living over here in Ireland for a good while. I met him in the prison yard, walking around the prison yard in Cloverhill Prison. You, you get an hour and a half around 12 o'clock for an hour and a half and then later on depends on the day the days you know move around sometimes it's the library sometimes it's having a game of pool sometimes it's, it's a little weight room where the where the gym is there on on c2 the first time i met him is when he was in the yard and he was a big huge guy you know and kind of, and kind of like a gentle giant like i said you know a nice quiet way about him to a certain point but obviously he's got a danger about him as well i can see that you know but uh he's not at all what you would think by looking at the size of him and, you know, all the other prisoners would be wary of him. Not all of them, because some of them are just kind of like, you know, uh, like para paranoid schizophrenics and paranoid schizophrenics, they live in a different world. They don't live in the world that we live in, right? They're, they're, they're on, they're on another fucking uh, TV signal there completely. And so Andre, so when I first seen him, he was just walking around the yard and kind of like, you know, and I was walking around the yard a good bit, talking to loads of different people, you know, kind of like, you know, some of the guys I was sharing a cell with, they walk around and talk to loads of different kind of people. They'd be looking over, they'd be looking, you know, making schemes, trying to get drugs in, like there's a big net over the, over the whole thing. And sometimes people, when they come into the prison, they throw a little kind of like small kinder egg, plastic kinder egg um, enclosing. And they'd put drugs in that and then sometimes they'd throw it over and they'd try and get it through the net and then the people walking in the yard would pick it up and then they'd have bits and pieces of drugs could be heroin marijuana mdma whatever stuff like that right so there's loads of drugs in prison you know they get it in no problem and the prison then the prison guards t turn up you know, they don't care dude so andre was walking around the yard and carrying a chessboard you know so i was striking a kind of conversation with him we got on pretty good and he was telling me, you know, one of the first things that you do when, when you meet one of the prisoners in the yard. And I like like to say when I was in this particular place or whatever, I would always want to go out into the yard. You know, the guy that I first went into the jail with, he wanted to stay. What well, There's a word for it. It was like, you know, in protection. It's like 24 hour lockdown. You don't want to come out of the cell because you're afraid that you're going to get stabbed, slashed slashed with usually they have like a double blade on a tooth on a toothbrush or something like that so when they cut the side of the face or cut the face open that if it's two bl blades close together they can't stitch it up right so it's an open wound and they can't stitch it up right so so i didn't really want to be in protection because even though i was kind of at the start i was kind of like well and then i was like no nah, i'd rather go out and just talk to the prisoners and get out and get some fresh air and kind of like you know walk around and you know, I, I, and I don't want to be hiding from prisoners and like hiding in the cells and stuff like that. You know, well, like the end of the day, kind of like, you know, you've got to make the best of whatever comes about. And there's always something to learn from whatever happens to you. So he'd be walking around with this big chessboard, Andre. And so we'd play chess. Every day we'd play chess. He'd come down, even if we didn't have a walk in the yard every day, because sometimes you'd have two walks a day, one around 12 o'clock, half 11 till about one. And then in the evening time or towards the evening time, we'd have another one for about an hour, 15 minutes, something like that. Right. So, so we played play chess and he, he was, uh, you know, he never played chess until two months earlier and he was really, really good at it. Really, really good at it. And he was only playing for two months, you know, so I, I've been playing chess. Well, I had been when I was younger, I was playing it a good bit when I was younger and stuff. So I, I kind of know how to play it. So, you know, so we played chess a good bit and, and, but he was really, really good. Like, like, like he didn't, he didn't ever really win. There was one time where I thought he was going to win and they called us for the yard to, to, to leave the yard. So when they call you for, to leave the yard, you got to leave straight away. Cause it's like the big turnstile there and you got to get out of the, 
and then they go back into the cell and then they're, they're locked down then usually for the night or till the next time they open the door right so that was the only time I thought he was going to win because and he looked like he was going to win because he already took my queen and he had a good few, few more extra pieces than, than I did and you know it looked like I was going down but anyway I was saved by the bell right because it looked like he was going to win and it was like you know okay Andre like we're going to go bro <laughs> you know we're, right we're sorry bro look, look, like maybe you were going to win maybe you weren't going to win I don't know bro but look we're going to go back into the cell right <laughs> right so he's like oh, fuck it fuck fuck it <laughs> right you know but uh and we got on pretty good and, and, you know, and then he started, a few days earlier, he told me what he was in for. I told him what I was in for, blah, 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 nonsense, you know, and kind of like, so he told me what he was in for and he said, and why, what he was in for was he had a car crash and his girlfriend, or I think he was his wife. Yeah, it was, he said it was his wife. Yeah, his wife. He hadn't even married about a year or something like that. He got into a crash. He fell asleep at the wheel or you know, something happened to him. And she was killed instantly. And the, whoever it was in the back, a friend in the back, he was killed instantly as well for some reason. I don't know or how it really, but he, but Andre was pretty much unscathed in the accident. He was pretty much kind of like, you know, no broken bones, nothing. I think a couple of scratches and he was all right. Yet the other two were killed outright, you know, so his wife was killed outright, you know, so, so he hadn't been here very long. You know, he, he had a house in, in Ratoth and which is not far from Ashburn. Yeah. So kind of like, you know, so he had this accident where his wife was killed and and the and the guy in the back seat was killed as well and you know and he was and when he woke up because he woke up he had some sort of a concussion or something like that and he woke up and he was handcuffed to the bed and there was police around him so they took a, a sample of his blood and all the rest of it and apparently what happened and you know this may be true or may not be true i don't know but I did get a second per, a man who verified it. And, and then some people were saying that maybe he had some sort of like uh, other drugs in his system. But he said, and someone else said it as well. And I kind of believed it, what he said it as well, because of just intuition of kind of like the way he was and that he was on pharmaceutical drugs. And I don't know if they said on the packaging that he wasn't supposed to be driving because of their sleeping tablets or some sort of like chemical concoction or whatever that you're not supposed to be driving. So like he was done for driving under the influence and he was taking pharmaceutical drugs, apparently. He was he was in, he's, he was in prison, you know, for at that point when I met him for about already seven months on remand. See, Clover Hill prison is a remand prison. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a, a sentence prison. There's a few people sentenced in Clover Hill prison. Very little though. It's, it's basically a remand prison where people go there to be, to be on remand and wait for their case it's a prison that they send you to to scare the shit out of you right that's that's the kind of prison that it is it's apparently one of the worst prisons in ireland so they want to scare you so you plead guilty and you get to try and get the fuck out of there it's all a scam the whole the whole system is a scam it's a whole scam they shouldn't be putting people in prison at all because you're supposed to be innocent till proven guilty right but how can they put people in prison at all for even two minutes when there hasn't been a jury of your peers said like the, the you know we, how can you put someone in prison at all when there's no there's no you're taking time off them and there's no one that said that you're guilty of anything you see how much of a scam it is even right there so he was in at that point uh, I'm like I said I'm not going to give dates and times and stuff at that point he was in already six or seven months and he still had another year to go till his case was going to even be heard so he was in remand he's going to be in remand or was in remand or whatever for basically a year and a half and then however the case went, then he'd get that time taken off. Just say if he got three years, then he'd serve a year and a half. Then probably with good behavior, he'd probably get out after about nine months, 10 months, something like that. But you can see how corrupt that the prison system is. It's basically, it serves as a double function. There's some people that deserve to be in prison and need to be there, you know, because they're paranoid schizophrenics and they're kind of like, you know, deranged and they don't, they will gut you like a fish and they won't think twice about it. And they're just, you know, they're off their head, but there can be very humorous as well, like I said. And, you know, and it's, it's an interesting dynamic when you go into prison because everything that you've learned beforehand means nothing in there. The only thing that just say, for instance, when I when I went there in this particular scenario, it's kind of like, you know, the only thing that I could bring with me was my own kind of like, you know, my own mind and my own system about how to deal with things and deal with myself and keep cool. You know, sometimes I can keep cool. I'm sure a lot of you listening to this as well have that same dynamic, that kind of wavering dynamic where it's kind of like, well, sometimes I can be cool and sometimes I can't be cool. 
but remaining cool where you need to be cool is a very useful asset, especially when you're in prison, because you can flip and then you're going to panic the other people around you. And then when people are panicking, then that's when shit gets kicked off. So the ability to be able to keep cool and calm that can, you know, other people can draw on that as well. You know what I mean? Because we all kind of like, if everyone's like, it's a big clusterfuck if everyone starts panicking, right? So Andre, you know, like, you know, the, the, these people that are in prison, some of these people that are in prison, they shouldn't be in there. So I just, I just, even just, just the story itself of kind of like him in prison at whatever time and stuff like that, you know, give a thought to these people sometimes, you know, I give a thought to them and stuff like you're, they're your fellow man and woman and stuff. And this system is so corrupt. And there's some people that are in prison that haven't got a lot of people that are in prison that have caused no loss injury and harm to anyone. They're either selling drugs or they're doing this or they're doing that. They may be a bit misguided in some ways, right? But still, at the same time, a lot of them are in there simply because where the system's set up as a criminal, the criminal justice system. There's a lot of people in prison that don't deserve to be there and they're rotting away in prison. They have been rotting away in prison and they will continue to be rotting in prison, you know? So as you're there, comfortable and all the rest of it, give a thought to these people, you know? And, you know, I think about Andre, from time to time and you know so playing chess with them was great so even at that time whenever it was it was kind of like you know when i when i remember when i left and you know and and they came up to me and said like you know you've got your uh, you know you're you're being released you know I, I have to admit man i didn't i didn't uh i didn't really like leaving them there you know so not really you know, kind of like, you know, so when you get released and kind of like, you know, and you leave all the people behind that you're in there with and they're, a lot of the prisoners are very genuinely happy for you and they have such a good side to them too. It's not, there's so much gray area when it comes to human beings. It's never just black and white. But I think about Andre sometimes and kind of like, you know, that he's in there and kind of like, you know, he had the, the obviously the pain of kind of like losing his wife and, you know, and you know, and he just bought his house at some point, you know, and, you know, and he didn't really know what he was doing. And he was from, from Romania. He didn't really have anyone there and stuff like that. And kind of like, you know, so think about these people, the odd time, because the system that we pay for treats a hell of a lot of people like trash and, and they're stuck in prison cells and their lives are, are they're, they're free, their physical freedom is taken away from them because of these revolting pieces of trash. So whenever I see the police, you know, you do whatever you want to do, right? Whoever's listening to this, you do whatever you want to do. But whenever I see the police, right, I don't care how nice they are or whatever. I think of some, some of the people that I've known, like I said, some of the people belong in prison because they're killers and some of them are horrendous with gray area too, right? But whenever I see the police, I think of some of these people that I've met and kind of like, you know, whether they're aware of it or not, they're still doing a job that says, yeah, we're going to arrest you for selling something, even though there's no loss in injury and harm, and we're going to lock you up. When I see the police, it is hard for me sometimes to have a care in my heart for them, or it doesn't happen all the time. You know, I'm really a care in your heart doesn't basically mean that you care about them as an individual. What it really means is that you see the unity of everything with you and everything else it can be anything, human beings, birds, everything. It's all, it's all part of the same thing, right? And it's, at its core, it's all part of the same thing. So that's what a care in your heart means. It means that, like, why would you end it? Why do you want to help hate yourself? So I didn't really like, you know, leaving them there and, and, and kind of like, you know, walking away and, get, and getting out and kind of like, you know, and yeah, sometimes it can be hard. You know, you leave people behind and kind of like, you know, and you look back and you kind of like, you know, and it molds you in a certain way when you're dealing with these probably so-called public servants and stuff and kind of like, you know, you look at them and you think like, you know, you know, these people, you know, seem to be innocent presenting right and they just got their costume on and they're just doing their job right well i see beyond it and i see people like andre in prison with years of his life been taken away from him for nothing and he had to lose his wife and you know and you know and he's in prison for what taping pharmaceuticals and having an accident because he was stressed out about his mortgage which they create by the way as well all that nonsense with mortgages and high prices and all the rest of it and where he was working like a trooper and you know, he was taking some sort of pharmaceuticals to try and stay awake because he was working so much and trying to pay for a house. And then an accident happened and that's what happened. You know, you know, I mean, probably part of it was his fault as well, you know, but like but being in prison for years over it. Anyway, that's that's the story I wanted to say about Andre, you know, and kind of like uh, two months as playing chess, man, he was pretty good. Pretty good, you know. <laughs> All right. 
का ये होगा